the strong Navy and Marine Corps are the foundation upon which the success of the Joint Force rests. The power of all our allies and partners working together across the world is the equivalent of a thousand ship Navy. Our priorities are and will remain strengthening our maritime dominance, building a culture of warfighting excellence, and enhancing strategic partnerships. We continue to build modern, capable platforms for our sailors and Marines to operate at, above, below, and from the sea. And we will not give up. I still remember my very first Navy League meeting, and ever since I've really come to respect the work that the Navy League does around the world to take care of our sailors and our Marines, and there just isn't enough way to say thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the CEO of the Navy League of the United States and 13th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Mike Stevens. It's always a relief when your uh, binder is actually on the podium. I didn't get a chance to come up here and check. All right, well, uh, welcome everyone. Good morning. All right, good morning. Yeah. All right. So uh, how about that video? That was terrific. Thanks to uh, James Peterson for uh, working with our team to put that together. Did anybody get a chance to go to the STEM event yesterday? Get a chance to see that? Yeah. So, the, the, so uh, thank you so much if you had a chance to uh, uh, enjoy that. We're always impressed with the number of students who make it to the STEM Expo every year. And all, uh, thank you to our champion sponsor, HII, and to our other corporate sponsors, CACI and Booz Allen, for making that STEM event possible. If it wasn't for those three organizations, frankly, we probably wouldn't be doing the event, so thank you very much. Uh, and it's because of their support that attendance has increased. From 2019, we had 700 uh, participants in that event, and yesterday, we think we came close to 3,000. So that's a, a great uh, jump in the numbers. Well, it's my honor to serve as the Chief Executive Officer for the Navy League of the United States, and it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to Sea Air Space 2024. For the next three days, you will be immersed in the most current maritime matters and technology, from the seabed to space and everything in between. You'll have an opportunity to listen to and interact with leadership from our Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Merchant Marines members of Congress and the defense industry. Sea Air Space is recognized as the most extensive maritime exposition in the entire world. And the Navy League is so very proud and committed to providing you with the absolute best experience possible. Sea Air Space 2024 would not be possible without the support of our sea service leaders, industry partners, speakers, exhibitors, and of course, our committed and loyal sponsors. I'd like to use this occasion to thank the amazing Navy League staff. It is a small but mighty team, and the Na at the Navy League, we have zero bench. To see them in action each day as they conduct the business of our organization and the work they do each year to deliver sea airspace for all of you is a wonder to behold. So I'll stop here and ask that you join me in giving them a round of applause. Thanks, team. At this time, I'd like to take the opportunity to also give a special shout out to our four-star sponsors, BAE Systems, General Dynamics, HII, L3 Harris, Lidos, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, QIntel, RTX, and SAIC. And to our two-star sponsors, Blue Halo, Bollinger Shipyards, CACI, Design, EY, GE Aerospace, IBM, and Textron Aviation Defense. Please everyone, let's give them a round of applause as well. The theme for this year's Expo is integrated maritime power. If the United States is to remain as the world's leader in maritime, in the maritime space, 
it is essential that integration happens at every level. With our different branches of service, allies and partners, with our defense industry, support from Congress, engaging our thought leaders at the academic and think tank level, and most importantly, support from the American people. At Sea Air Space, you will see all of this and more. Now I'd like to welcome to the stage the Navy League's 52nd National President, Mr. Chris Townsend, call sign Townie. But before I do, let me say this. Townie is a difference maker for our organization. The position he holds as the National President and our Chairman for the Navy League is a demanding role. Please keep in mind that Townie is a full-time, ultra-long-haul Delta Airline pilot. He's an A350 captain and instructor pilot. Over the past year, he's devoted as much time on the road with our Navy League councils around the globe as he's spent flying for Delta. That doesn't mean he's flying less as a captain. What it means is he's been away from home twice as much. And I might add, he does all this work for the Navy League as a volunteer. That means zero pay. Before Townie was elected to national president, he and I barely knew each other. I can assure you, we know each other now and have become great friends and a formidable team. His resume is impressive and there's so much more I could say, but in the spirit of time, I'll stop here and say, Townie, the floor is yours. Come on up, sir. So like Mike said, it's nice when your binder's here, uh, so mine's not. <laughs> Thank you, Mick Pond, and uh, good morning. It is an absolute honor to be here with you to kick off the Navy League's 59th Sierra Space and to introduce our opening ceremony speaker. On behalf of all of our over 30,000 Navy League members worldwide, I thank you for attending the largest maritime exposition in North America. Please indulge me for a moment as I speak briefly about our Navy League. But first, I'd like to echo Mick Pond's uh, praise about our staff. They are small, but mighty, and they are an absolutely, truly exceptional team. They are uh, professionals that expertly execute the business of the Navy League each and every day. But please note that every great team has an amazing coach behind them. And for us, that is Mike Stevens. Please join me in thanking Mike for his amazing leadership of the Navy League. I often say without hesitation that the Navy League is now as strong as we have ever been in our 121 year history. That all started just over five years ago with the hiring of Mike Stevens. This past January 31st marked the two year anniversary of the ribbon cutting for our Center for Maritime Strategy. Admiral Jamie Fogo and his team of brilliant navalists have really raised the bar for our organization. If you're not following the CMS, please do so. They are putting out some amazing, incredibly re relevant content. Finally, we have an all hands initiative uh, across the Navy League to strengthen and rebuild our local Navy League councils and are seeing some incredible progress. As you enjoy the next three days here at Sea Air Space, if you're not a member of the Navy League, please consider joining this great team. We can sign you up right at the information booth right up front. To all of, all of you who serve in and out of uniform and dedicate your lives to strengthening American maritime power, thank you. For more than 120 years, the Navy League has been dedicated to its mission of education, advocacy, and support of America's sea services Sea Air Space is just one of the many avenues our organization takes to fulfill that mission. It is this platform that allows us to connect all of those associated with the maritime domain across the world and right here in the United States for discussions like the one we're about to witness here this morning. The Navy League thanks all of you for being here for the uh, opening of Sea Air Space 2024. Please give yourselves a round of applause. Thanks so much for being here. It is now uh, my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce our first official speaker of Sea Air Space 2024, the Honorable Eric Raven, Undersecretary of the Navy. 
Under Secretary uh, Raven serves as the Department of the Navy's Chief Operating Officer and Chief Management Officer. He is the second highest ranking civilian within the Department of the Navy and is responsible for providing policy guidance and oversight for a wide range of defense matters, including strategy development, intelligence, space activities, and critical infrastructure sustainment. Additionally, is responsible for, for business operations, performance management, and risk management of the department. He was recently designated as the Department of Defense Senior Defense Official for Guam. Prior to assuming his current duties in April of 2022, Mr. Raven served in various legislative leadership positions, including on the Committee of Appropriations and the Subcommittee on Defense in the United States Senate. He also served in the offices of Senators Feinstein, Kennedy, and Byrd. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Eric Raven, Under Secretary of the Navy. Well, thanks so much for that uh, introduction, and it's great to be back here at Sea Air Space. It's truly a premier maritime exposition that it surpasses our high expectations each and every year. A special thanks to you, Julie Howard, and the rest of your uh, team, Mike. Uh, bravo Zulu for your ability to put together an event that is truly out of this world. And of course, I'm talking about putting the space into sea air space with today's rare total, uh, total solar eclipse. But before the service chiefs talk, I wanna take this opportunity to highlight some uh, trends and observations that I see from my perspective as Under Secretary of the Navy. First, our Joint Fighting Force stands ready, resilient, and flexible against the backdrop of today's dynamic geopolitical landscape. The Navy and Marine Corps team is deployed globally. We are at the tip of the spear, operating alongside our allies and partners and deterring our adversaries shoulder to shoulder. We support naval diplomacy, crisis response, building partnerships, and we protect the world's economy, which floats on seawater. As we gather here today, our men and women who wear the cloth of our nation actively deter and respond to a wide set of challenges. Meanwhile, our Department of Navy civilians work tirelessly to ensure that our sailors and Marines are trained, ready, and have the capabilities to accomplish the mission and that our families are taken care of. Together, as a Navy Marine Corps team, alongside those we call allies and partners, but more importantly, friends, we uphold international norms, keep sea lanes open, and provide access to free and open oceans so that others can share in a future of freedom and prosperity. Over a third of our battle force ships are deployed and a fifth are underway. They are not anchored or tethered to the pier. They're demonstrating our unique ability where it matters, when it matters. They are out there doing the nation's tasking, accomplishing the mission, working side by side with our allies and partners, focused on war fighting and interoperability. We operate in every single domain. We are on, above, and below the sea, including space and cyber, and ready to respond to crises or conflict. We are ready to deter, and we are ready to prevail. In this dynamic environment and era of strategic competition, the Navy and Marine Corps role is consequential. To this end, I'm proud to tell you that the United States Navy and United States Marine Corps team is stronger than ever and unified in our support to the Joint Force. And when I speak of the strength of our naval forces, I'm mindful that words matter, but actions speak louder than words. In the Red Sea, we're defending the freedom of the seas against an adversary carrying out indiscriminate attacks against peaceful mariners. In the Indo-Pacific, we're accelerating the fielding of key capabilities for the Marine Corps stand-in force. In addition, by strengthening our ties with allies and partners and through our daily operations, we're setting the conditions to maximize deterrence, not just for the next few months or years, but for the long term. In the high north, 
Our ally Norway and the United States Marine Corps, alongside many other partners, just concluded a major exercise that demonstrates our resolve and commitment to our NATO allies, while proving that we can operate in any climate and any place. Make no mistake, your Navy and Marine Corps continues to strengthen our maritime dominance, just as Secretary Del Toro directs in the first of his three enduring priorities. But you may ask, what is needed to continue to advance this priority? This is where I remind you that you're talking to a former appropriator. We need budgets that support our strategy with people and readiness coming first. It is true, the Department of the Navy's 2025 budget involves some tough choices. Putting quality of service and readiness at the top of the priority list means other programs must either make do or take risk. But this budget proposal makes significant advances in modernizing key naval capabilities. It boldly advances our undersea capabilities for both US and AUKUS demands. It solidifies our commitment to 31 amphibious ships and advances the landing ship medium into production. The Navy is leading the execution of Replicator, the revolutionary approach to fielding advanced, uncrewed technologies in operationally relevant timeframes. You can tell that I'm excited about this, not just because you have the former appropriator talking about money, but because what these priorities mean for the Navy and Marine Corps team. Indeed, I'm excited for the future of our maritime services as we meet the challenges of today and tomorrow together. I'm also very excited to listen to the thoughts of the impressive cadre of leaders on the stage next. With that, please join me in welcoming the event's first panel. First, Admiral Lisa Franchetti, the Chief of Naval Operations. Second, General Chris Mahoney, the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps. Third, Admiral Linda Fagan, Commandant of the Coast Guard. Fourth, the Honorable Ann Phillips, Administrator of the Maritime Administration. And finally, I'd like to invite Mr. Francis Rose, our returning moderator and the host of the TV show and podcast, FedGov Today, to kick off our panel. Thank you, everyone. See you out on the convention floor. Good morning. It's great to be here again. It's great to see all of you. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience and uh, on the stage, so it's wonderful to see all of you as well. Um, a note about questions. Uh, we've already gotten some questions about the question. You have a QR code on your table. If you shoot that with your phone, you'll get a message uh, that will get that right to this iPad right here. And I will be able to pose the questions throughout the course of the conversation not just reserve time at the end uh, for the chiefs throughout the course of the discussion. So start sending those now. Uh, I'll ask you to put in the message your name and who you're with, and if it's directed to one of the chiefs in particular, to uh, do that as well. Uh, I welcome all of you and thank you for your time today. Um, Admiral Franchetti, I wanna start with you. Um, FY25 budget season is here. You can tell by the pollen in the air, a friend of mine the other day <laughs> said, I know when budget season's coming, um, for when my allergies kick in. Um, where are you on the 25 budget? Uh, the undersecretary talked about it a moment ago. Um, give me some follow-up on what he had to say about what you're going to be going to the Hill and asking for specifically. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Francis. And uh, I just wanna quickly say thank you very much to the Navy League and to uh, everyone that had a hand in putting together this amazing sea, air, and space uh, 2024. I know we're gonna have a great series of conversations all week uh, about everything related to the maritime and all the work that all of our organizations do every day for that strong defense. Uh, of our nation. Um, so thanks a lot for the question about the, about the budget. As uh, Undersecretary Raven was just saying, 
uh, you know, FY25 is a, was a year of tough choices. Uh, we're in a fiscally constrained environment under the Fiscal Responsibility Act. The Navy, you know, saw just a 0.7 increase in our budget. And so when you think about all the missions that we have to do from being prepared for prompt, sustained operations, combat operations incident to the sea, as well as the peacetime national security and prosperity of our nation, a lot of choices had to be made. And so when I took a step back and looked at what are those big priorities, um, I think you can put them into really four categories. The first one, of course, is Columbia and uh, recapitalizing our strategic deterrent, which everything else rests on. Our job is to deter, uh, and if that fails, fight and win. And so investing in Columbia is where we need to be. Uh, the second priority is, just like Undersecretary Raven said, is really in the near-term readiness of our forces and in our people. In America's Warfighting Navy that I put out in January, I talked about my priorities of warfighting warfighters and the foundation that supports them. And being able to invest in those three things in this decisive decade is critical. So you're gonna see a lot of investments in readiness uh, and making sure that we have the platforms uh, with the right resources, with the right munitions, with the right level of readiness, maintenance, uh, spare parts, things that we need, as well as our people with the right training. So you'll see that. Mm -hmm. I think the third thing is that, again, it's really important that we work with our industry partners. You can see uh, the demand signal for the larger Navy that we have out there. We have 88 ships under contract. We have 66 under construction. There's 57 if you look across the fit up. We know we need a larger Navy. Every study since 2016 has shown that. And I think the most effective way to work on that right now is to invest in our industrial base, invest in the workforce, invest in the, alongside our industry partners in the infrastructure necessary to really set the conditions to speed up uh, the production and the throughput of the, of the ships and submarines really that we need to get more players on the field. So mm -hmm. if you look ahead, I think you'll see that that is really a demand signal that we're sending uh, in our budget. Number of there, uh, things there I'll come back to throughout the course of the conversation. Um, General Mahoney, she touched on a number of things that I know are priorities in your, uh, as you're getting ready to go to the Hill too and talk about what, what you need for the Marine Corps, what there connects with what you're going to ask for, sir. Yeah, first of all, uh, Everything I say is on behalf of the Commandant, so if I get it wrong, I'll be hearing it uh, mm. in uh, the very near future. But uh, everything the CNO said is right on. When I look at our ability to be uh, a stand-in force, a crisis response force, a force that is ready to go today, not at D plus 60, it relies heavily, crucially, and critically on uh, the U.S. Navy. When you look at the 25 program, uh, LPDs, LHAs, LSMs are all laid in in a way that keeps us at 31 amphibs statutory uh, requirement and I think gets us to, to uh, a point of industrial health where for LPDs, for instance, uh, we put them on two-year centers. For LHAs, uh, four-year centers, which is very sustainable from what I understand. And the LSM, as we build that in, we'll learn as we go with a, with a target of 35 ships but make an, in, an initial investment. Uh, to see what exactly that craft will do for us. All three of those are, are built into the 25 plan with a little bit of a push uh, with some money in 24, uh, 500 million of uh, advanced procurement versus the LPD. So from a Marine Corps standpoint and what catalyzes and enables us to stand in, uh, what allows us to be ready, the 25 program right now is, is looking very strong. Thank you for that, What General. would make it stronger uh, is, to, is to bundle those ships, and we have authority to do so in the NDA, uh, not only for two reasons. Uh, number one, to save the taxpayer money. If you buy four ships and you get a 10% discount, that's a cost avoidance or a savings, depending on how you approach it. And, and from the other angle that the CNO talked about, that provides headlights for the, for the industrial base to attract more workers. And not just pipe fitters and welders, but uh, managers, engineers, and architects that otherwise might not see a future that far out. Uh, you bundle those ships and you show them that future and you complete that righteous cycle between production, attracting a workforce, attracting sub-tier vendors, attracting workers, and it feeds itself to get you to that, I think, two things, the foundation that the CNO is talking about and more players on the field. 
Uh, I want to come back to the industrial base issue because it's something that I know in talking to your teams, all of you are thinking about and talking about. Admiral Fagan, um, I would say that probably the most top of mind item uh, for us watching what the Guard does is what happened in Baltimore a couple of weeks ago. How does that impact the way that you're going about your long-term strategic planning? We have an incident like that that kind of comes out of nowhere uh, and pulls demand. I mean, certainly a test of your readiness, I imagine. Yeah, so uh, the, the tragedy in Baltimore you know, about a week and a half ago now, uh, and of course the Coast Guard along with several other you know, federal and uh, state and city entities are in the forefront of that, uh, that, that recovery uh, operation. It certainly, you know, initially that was a search and rescue case, and that is one of the bread and butter missions that the Coast Guard uh, does, you know, here in the homeland and also assist some of our allies and partners with. Uh, and then as you look at now the complexity of the recovery of the marine transportation system, right, and the Coast Guard lives in that uh, realm day in, day out. And so uh, working with the, the Corps of Engineers, uh, soup salve and others to remove debris, stabilize the ship, and begin to reconstitute uh, port operations in, in Baltimore. One of our uh, core competencies is we're an emergency uh, response organization. Uh, at all times, a military force, a law enforcement organization, we're a regulator, but we have a particular skill in sort of crisis leadership management, and you see that play out in Baltimore. Certainly it uh, impacts, you know, we've got small boats, larger cutters there helping provide safety and security zones and supporting uh, that, that work and that demand is, is always there. As I look a little more broadly beyond just Baltimore and the work that uh, we do uh, not in the homeland, in and around the homeland, the demand for the Coast Guard uh, is deafening and it's worldwide and it's in particular uh, allies and partners, small sovereign nations who benefit uh, from either the presence of a Coast Guard cutter or a training team or law enforcement detachments, our authority and capability brought to bear in partnership with another nation is really a uh, unique contribution that the United States Coast Guard makes to our broader national security and national uh, portfolio. I'll pause there. We'll talk, I'm hoping we come back to uh, ships. We too are in the uh, largest acquisition that we've had since uh, World War II. Uh, we compete for the same industrial base space, both new construction and repair with the Navy. And it's just, it's critical for the nation that we've got that kind of reliable access and, and commitment to uh, the new ship capacity and then repair capacity and maintenance capacity for the ships that are that are operating. Yeah, Thank you. we will definitely come back to that, Admiral. Thank you for that. Administrator, welcome. It's great to see you again. Um, you've got the same issues, it sounds like, based on, on the research that I've done that the other chiefs here have, have talked about today. Is that a fair read on my part, ma'am? It is, certainly. Thank you, Francis, and uh, honored to be here uh, again this year with my colleagues. Um, General, you're outnumbered, sir, sorry. Um, anyway, um, I wasn't going to bring it up. <laughs> I had to get that in there because it was. I didn't worry about there. being outnumbered. I, I, I worried about being the dumbest guy on the stage. <laughs> I, I've got you covered, General. <laughs> okay. You're good. Okay. So a little about Marad because I've had several people since I've just been here this morning say, "What is Marad exactly? What do they do?" So I'm an operational promotional agency. I run a fleet of 48 ready reserve fleet ships in support of the Department of Defense. Uh, and funded by Navy through Navy N4. Uh, in addition to that, I help oversee our uh, US flag, commercial carriers, maritime security, cable fleet security, tanker security programs, uh, work closely in that context with labor, with carriers, with a whole host of stakeholders across industry in a promotional circumstance. My funding is half Navy and half DOT. Uh, in the DOT side, of course, there is the maritime security program, the three programs I just mentioned, but also port infrastructure development and other things. So in that context, very much involved in the, the tragic events that have taken place in Baltimore, working with the port up there to help them find solutions to some of the many challenges they have, along with a host of other stakeholders, and of course, under the guidance and leadership of the Coast Guard and the Army Corps, who are doing the uh, initially the SAR and now the, the salvage and recovery efforts. Um, also work closely uh, to, we have four ready reserves ships in Baltimore right now. They can't get out of, of the total of 48. There's still 44. Uh, but uh, that is a fact. And, and that, that's a, a circumstance that you know, we have to learn to live with and, and 
for the moment. There's supposed to be six there. One's in the yards and one's in Norfolk waiting to get in. So, uh, but we have lots of capacity if we need it. But maintaining the ready reserve gets to some of our challenges. We too share the same maintenance facilities, the same dry dock facilities, the same ship building capacity. We are building new ships, training vessels. I think we'll get to that in another question. But um, lot, lots of opportunities and challenges there. And of course, this ready reserve fleet, these are aging vessels. The average age is 45 years old. So the longer you maintain them, the more money you spend. And a lot of them are steam. In fact, two of the four in, in Baltimore are steam. And there are very few people who know how to operate those vessels now. So uh, a lot of challenges there, a lot of opportunities, vessel acquisition manager program. We'll talk about that, vessel construction manager. But um, uh, we, we are closely aligned uh, under the government shipbuilding program, uh, which uh, SECNAV oversees in, in working with the Navy and the Coast Guard, Army Corps, NOAA, others who share the same need for the same capacity, uh, very interested in building capacity across and creating an industrial base that can then support the defense industrial base. If we don't have a broad maritime construction capacity, uh, we will not be able to single-handedly just point at, we're gonna support submarines, we're gonna support Navy shipbuilding. We have to lift the entire industry to be able to provide that capacity across the board. So lots to talk about there. So we'll talk about shipbuilding then right away because that seems to be something that all of you are thinking about talking about. Administrator Phillips, um, your team wrote to me about the national security multi-mission vessels. Tell me about that program and where it stands now and what you think others might be able to learn from that program. So the NSMB, National Multi-Mission uh, Security Vessel Support Vessels, are uh, training vessels, a series of five ships that we are building in support of our requirement to provide a training vessel to our state maritime academies. There are six state maritime academies. Great Lakes is in a different category. They have different kinds of vessels. These five vessels, multi-mission, meaning they, have, they can be called upon by the president to do other things, and they will be training vessels for the state maritime academies. Uh, built using an innovative vessel construction manager concept where we contract with a vessel construction manager, think industry, think commercial industry in the shipbuilding world and ship management world. It's Tote Services is managing this construction. And they then contract with the shipyard. They contracted with Philly Ship to build these five vessels. First vessel, Empire State, is delivered to New York, SUNY. She's been on her maiden voyage and she'll be sailing again later this year. A second ship, Patriot State, is uh, nearing completion. She'll be delivered to Mass Maritime later this spring, early summer. And uh, State of Maine, we launched Friday. So she's, uh, we have three now um, floating in some way, shape, or form. Texas uh, gets the next one, number four, and then the last vessel, uh, California uh, Golden State will be delivered at, at the end. In between, Philly is building a rockfall vessel, so they have a commercial contract in between uh, the, the four and five, and they have three more vessels to build for Matson after that, um, and other things coming, we think, in the future. So what's innovative about this is we started with firm fixed price contract, 100% design, and, and in that context, a very small change order budget, uh, which we have not spent all of. So when you're able to start with 100% design, and, and granted, this is a training vessel, it's, a, I would argue, a world-class training vessel, but a very strict set of requirements that we were able to stick to. Um, we thank Congress for the funding to be able to build these vessels, but uh, when you have 100% design, when you have a firm fixed price contract, when you have, by law, a very small change order budget, and you have commercial best practices being applied, uh, you are able to move through these, this vessel construction and vessel procurement. We're on budget. Uh, we're nearly on time. There's a 122-day uh, excusable delay based on COVID and some other th challenges that the first hull uh, and, and so subsequent hulls will encounter. But um, we're doing really well with it. Knock on wood, um, we're excited about it, and we think this particular strategy has great promise for other things. So does Congress. They've given us $12 million to begin to design a sea lift vessel working with Navy uh, for what their needs might be for the future uh, ready reserve to work in concert with vessel acquisition and, of course, maintaining the existing fleet. So lots of interesting things to think about there, and um, we look forward to continuing that process in the future. Thank you, ma'am. Um, coming on, Fagan, you talked about uh, platforms a moment ago. I've tracked the Polar Security Cutter program over the course of the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. Where does that stand today, and what are your other platform priorities right now as far as shipbuilding? Yeah, no, thank you. And so uh, Polar Security Cutter is our you know, top uh, acquisition a priority, and of course, along with the offshore patrol cutter. So um, let me start with the offshore patrol cutter. The first uh, class, Argus, was launched last fall, and we're really excited 
uh, to see that ship in the water is just going to be a great, uh, capable uh, ship when uh, when she comes into uh, comes into the the fleet built by Eastern Shipbuilding. It was a phase two recompete that uh, Austell uh, received the phase two award, and it's a perfect example of you know Navy's got a lot of shipbuilding going on there. Just the need for this reliable uh, capacity across the industrial base. Our 24 appropriation included money for a commercially available icebreaker, so that will allow us to bring uh, some ice-capable uh, ship into the fleet sooner uh, than the timeline for construction for Polar Security Cutter. Uh, we're, we're on contract and you know, budget for Polar Security uh, Cutter and uh, working hard to get to the detailed design maturity necessary to begin cutting steel, and the intent is to do that uh, this year. It is important to remember that we are an Arctic nation, right? Our, uh, we've got incredible you know, national sovereignty and security uh, interest in the Arctic. Uh, we have a large exclusive economic uh, zone and creating actual presence with ice capable ships is critical to our national security. There's, a, there's also you know, conversation around, again, national security and sovereignty as you look at uh, Antarctica and the, the mission there to keep McMurdo and the South Pole supported. And so uh, I certainly feel a sense of urgency for, for building and to begin operating that polar uh, security cutter. We have not built a ship uh, of this nature since the mid-70s, which is when the polar uh, star was commissioned. But polar star continues to uh, operate, meet mission. Uh, she just got back from Antarctica. She's in the yard in Mayer Island, and we will send her uh, south again when we uh, need to do that resupply. And then the Coast Guard Cutter Healy, which is the nation's medium icebreaker, just finished a uh, you know high latitude scientific operations, but also uh, operating uh, you know in in and around uh, you know our our partner nations uh, in the in the Arctic, and then circumnavigated uh, the continent of North America. But uh, continuing to field ships to replace aging legacy assets. So the offshore patrol cutter will replace our 210 foot cutters, many of them over 50 50 years old and the polar security cutter to create that capacity for the nation uh, to ensure our, our sovereignty. And the interesting thing about the Arctic, right, the patterns of use are beginning to change. You can see it already. Mm -hmm. The crab, uh, crab collapse a couple of years ago in the Bering speaks to changing water temperatures, migratory fish pattern changes, increased human use, cruise ship activity, and uh, you know others who are focused in the Arctic, and again, creating actual presence uh, matters. And uh, we're we're leaned in on the polar security cutter as a as a priority acquisition. Thank I you. had three notes about the Arctic, ma'am, um, that I just scribbled down: ice melt, traffic, and China. Yep. And it sounds like you touched on all those except China. That's, yep. I, I, everybody knows Russia's been up there for decades. Yep. I'm not sure. So yeah, the the Chinese obviously a couple of years ago declared themselves as a near uh, Arctic nation, not a term that's recognized anywhere uh, internationally, but they operate uh, several ice-capable research vessels, the Zhui Long 1 and Zhui Long 2, and continue to see them uh, operate those ships, not just in the Arctic, but also in Antarctica, where the Chinese are building a deep water port uh, in, you know, a couple, it's, it's sort of in the vicinity, but not particularly close to where we operate McMurdo, but you can see uh, the interest on the part of the Chinese in operating in both uh, both of the high latitudes. And so again, creating uh, capacity matters. And then as you look into the Eastern Arctic, our uh, commitment and partnership and allyship with the other Arctic nations is absolutely critical and essential. And so whether, you know, it's our, our great partnership with the, with the Canadians or, uh, you know, pick any of the Arctic nations, bolstering those understandings and capacity to interoperate become really uh, critical. In fact, uh, the Arctic Coast Guard uh, Forum is uh, next week, hosted by Norway, and it just speaks to how strong our partnerships are as we look to create that capacity and counter uh, Russia, China, and other, uh, other actors. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, CNO, you were talking uh, in, before we came out about visiting shipyards recently. What did you see there what are the platforms that are high priority for you? You talked about a little bit about them when you discussed FY25 budget requests. Sure, I've had a great opportunity both as the vice chief now as CNO, and in fact, 
Joan Mahoney and I were just down on the Gulf Coast uh, visiting different shipyards down there. And again, you know, the critical, the shipbuilding industry is absolutely critical, as everyone, as everyone said here. And first, it was great to go out and see all the great patriots that are out there, you know, working on each one of our platforms. There's a lot of commitment. There's a lot of energy, uh, you know, whether it's someone who's working in engineering design or it's someone who's a pipe fitter or a welder, you know, you see the pride that they're putting into developing these capabilities that there were our sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, mer uh, merchant mariners are <laughs> going to be able to, uh, you know, get underway. So, you know, as we went around, um, you know, definitely we focused on amphibs, as, as General Mahoney just talked about, destroyers, you know, aircraft carriers and submarines. You know, all of these are priorities, you know, for what we do every day. I think, you know, what I generally heard from industry UI was out there is that a lot of the investments that we put into the budget uh, are the same investments that they're making. Um, all of the industry partners are facing some of the same challenges in the workforce. Um, it's both on the recruiting of the workforce, but more importantly on the retention mm -hmm. uh, once they bring the folks in the door. Uh, so we're working uh, alongside industry to generate some of these pipelines uh, where people can be recruited, they can come in, they can get training, they can come out with a certification and then immediately go uh, and be employed. But the reality is a three-year supervisor versus a 15-year supervisor is a different mm -hmm. uh, animal. And again, so how do we continue to grow those supervisors that we need in the future? Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that everyone you know, shared some concerns about is the supplier base, long lead time materials. Uh, again, making sure that we can invest in those smaller uh, businesses, then again, support the businesses, uh, the broader big businesses to get what we need. Again, a lot of those things, when you look back in the Reagan era at how many shipyards we had, you look at how many supplier or sub suppliers there were, we, there's a lot of that is really atrophied. So mm -hmm. when you think about Secretary Del Toro's, you know, Maritime Statecraft Initiative, there was a previous one in Marad mm -hmm. also to look at that broader industrial base. That's what a lot of our investments are going towards. Mm -hmm. The other piece is process improvement, data analytics, you know, having a better understanding of, uh, you know, seeing ourselves, seeing where the choke points are, and then how do we make those targeted and investments to, again, set the conditions to really meet the cadence that we need in the future. If you think about Columbia coming online to a cadence of one Columbia a year in the FY26, uh, you think about we need 2.33 Virginias on top of that to meet both our own commitments and then AUKUS. Uh, you know, collectively, we have a lot of work to do to be able to set the conditions to increase that cadence mm -hmm. uh, and the throughput. Yeah. Last time we talked, um, we talked about the size of the fleet and the fact that there have been a lot of discussion about the number of ships over time. How much of a, of a priority are you placing on the size of the fleet and how much of a, an emphasis are you placing on the makeup of the fleet, what the components are of that fleet? Yeah, well, it's, it's pretty clear that we do need a larger Navy. And again, every study since 2016 has said uh, that we need a larger Navy. And so collectively, we all need to focus on that. But the more important thing right now is having a ready Navy. Mm. So, you know, when you talk about more players on the field, that really is ready players on the field. So again, if you have platforms, but they don't have the munitions or they don't have the people uh, to be able to man, operate them, and then deliver that lethality, um, that is not the capability that we want to have. So in this decisive decade, really focus on the readiness as we continue to invest in that infrastructure that is going to set the conditions to really accelerate our shipbuilding as we go forward. General Mahoney, what did you see on that trip when you were with the CNO? Yeah, it was a, a great trip along the Gulf Coast, and we went to three different yards, uh, and we saw all different type uh, model series of ships. Interestingly enough, uh, in Pascagoula, uh, we were on LHA-8, uh, USS Bougainville, beautiful ship uh, with a lot of different modifications, putting the well deck back in, making the flight deck bigger, moving the uh, the deck house so that uh, you can do maintenance on different types of uh, aircraft without having to fold them or send them down below. We went on LPD-29, the USS McCool, and another beautiful ship, brand new, got to address, address the crew over the 1MC. Uh, but what I saw uh, in capability, it was the third ship that was in front of those two ships, and that was DDG-128, uh, the USS Ted Stevens. And when you put all three of those together as I stood back, I said, that right there is, is naval power. That is the ability to penetrate, to exploit, to destroy. And the American industrial base has that capability. 
but it requires, as the CNO just said, a, a level schedule, the ability to invest with a predictive resource stream so that those investments become real, so that that young 18-year-old that wants to come aboard as an apprentice welder at X amount of dollars per hour or can go work at Starbucks for the same X amount, but in three years he's gonna make, be making 2X or she's gonna be making 3X and will go into management. Once again, that righteous cycle, I think, is where we really need to concentrate. Um, but also balance that with, as the CNO said, players on the field and near-term readiness, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It does. Uh, how much of that, in, in your view, can the services do, sir? And how much of that is it the responsibility of industry to do? And, and what does the combination, what's the intersection of that look like, General? Yeah, it, it has to be concomitant. It, there has to be a relationship there. And let me, let me just, not to get too esoteric, Chinese shipbuilding is a strategic state-owned enterprise where it is financed, where it can call the shot on steel prices, call the shot on paint prices, call the shot on electric cable prices. That's something that is favorable to that strategic industry. Where we come from, these are private industries that have to exist in a very competitive market. Uh, they have very few people who buy from them. So there has to be a different relationship in order to compete with a, with a state-run strategic interest. Admiral, you were nodding pretty enthusiastically as he talked mm -hmm. about that. What resonated with what General Mahoney said there for you, ma'am? Well, really, it's a partnership. You know, it has to be a partnership with us and in industry. It's a commitment on the part of both uh, to be able to move forward the way we need to do that. And again, that extends all the way down to the 50 person companies that you know, make parts mm. that will eventually go into one of our commitments and into one of our platforms. How does that look different today and why do you think it does than it did 10 years ago? You talked about World War II, um, the Reagan administration, the buildup during that. And not for the sake of casting stones, but for the sake of how we move forward to get back to that place if that's possible. Well, I think, you know, you can't, you really can't buy back time. I mean, there right. was a time when, uh, you know, we were not investing as heavily uh, in the ships uh, in the Navy. There was a lot of reasons for that. We were fighting uh, wars uh, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. There was a lot of choices that were made and there was some uh, second and third order effects of that. So I know we can get exactly back to where we were in the in the Reagan years and the you know if you want to look at that as a time when we built a significant amount of ships in a short period of time. And I know that our our partners in industry are ready and capable to do that. Um, we've all mentioned people as an issue and you specifically talked about retention versus just recruitment um, and in industry as a po and, and not just in the services. Um, where does that stand? What are you doing differently than maybe you were doing five years ago uh, than you are today, ma'am? Well, you started with retention. Yeah. So it is two sides of the coin. So yeah. I'm, you know, I'm happy to say you know, that retention is very good uh, in the Navy right now in almost all of our fields. And so to me, that's a signal that people are really committed to our mission. They understand what they do and that our sailors, their, our civilians and their families really understand that they're valued and uh, that we continue to work hard to make sure that our quality of service and the investments we're making in both their quality of work uh, and their quality of life are meeting their needs. And we wanna remain that world-class employer of choice so people stay on our team. On the recruiting side of the house, you know, we're very focused on recruiting. If we, we can have all the best platforms in the world, but if we don't have the warfighters that can employ them, then we are not gonna be uh, an effective Navy. So we're focused hard on recruiting. Um, a few things that we're doing differently just on the, the recruiting side of the house is we've just elevated our head of Navy recruiting to a season two star. Um, we had taken a lot of people out of our recruiting stations when we were putting them into our ships. Uh, by the end of May, we'll fully man all of our recruiting stations because that is really who gets out there and talks with not only the future sailors, but also the, all the influencers, the coaches, the teachers, the church leaders, wherever people are influenced, we wanna make sure we're getting out and having that conversation. I think the maritime services in general have a little bit of more of a challenge because people suffer from sea blindness. They don't really understand if you don't live near a base or you don't live near a coast, you may not really understand what your Navy does for you, your Navy, Marine Corps, your Coast Guard do for you every day. 
And so how can we get out and, uh, and reach across the rich fabric of America? So that talent is there in every zip code. Mm -hmm. Some of the other things we're doing, though, is also expanding the pool uh, of folks that can join our Navy team. So if anybody out there is not turned 42 yet, uh, there should be some recruiters around who can uh, <laughs> sign you up. And uh, if your kid is in the, uh, in the above 18, you and your kid can re-enlist simultaneously. And uh, we'll, that'll be a really good, we'll make a good story of that. <laughs> Um, but that's, where, again, there, it's, we've also put in place uh, a future sailor preparatory class, both for uh, physical fitness uh, and for academic, again, to give folks uh, a little bit more time to uh, rise up to the physical fitness standards we have. But on the academic side, it's to give them more opportunities for more ratings, more specialties uh, in the Navy so they can be what they want to be mm -hmm. uh, in our Navy. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. And uh, it's starting to really pay off. We're seeing some good investments in that. And uh, I'm very excited. We're able to maintain our very high standards of, uh, of our recruits, and we're really excited to welcome more players on the field in the people side of the yeah. house, too. Parent and child simultaneous enlistment sounds like a social media opportunity. <laughs> <It's> absolutely <laughs> waiting for a place to happen. Um, Admiral Fagan, uh, what, where are you as far as recruiting yep. and especially as far as retention? Uh, no. so I. You know, it strikes me, certainly, and as we've talked about defense industrial base, uh, all of the acquisition and investments being made in, in capacity for our maritime services, uh, none of that matters if you don't have workforce. The ships can't be built. We can't operate the ships or the aircraft. And so recruiting and then retaining workforce is really, it is, it's existential to the, to the services and to the nation and our national security. Uh, we, at the peak of our shortfall, we had about a 3,500 person a shorting, shortage in junior non-rates uh, and uh, junior petty officers. And we have had to make decisions organizationally uh, to invest in operational capacity that best meets the needs and expectations for the nation. So we've, uh, er, we're moving forward decommissionings on some of our ships, we've changed uh, some of the way we are operating and managing uh, stations in smaller units. This is a direct uh, impact of the shortfall. Now, good news, uh, we have, uh, we've kind of recovered. We're back to filling buses into, into Cape May. And, you know, I, it's a couple of things. We're, we're sort of, we're enough post-COVID, things are starting uh, to normalize. And we as well had taken recruiting capacity out of the system that we've been in the process of reinvesting in over the last couple of years. We've increased our recruiting capacity by almost 25%. Uh, we are going to young people where they are, not where we think we might find them. Twitch, it's an online collaborative gaming site, which surprisingly, there's a lot of 20 year olds uh, there, the target uh, audience. And so uh, increasing capacity, uh, being, being more intentional with where we're targeting our uh, marketing dollars, and then we've also been standing up junior ROTC programs, again, illuminating to young people what service looks like, what the opportunities are uh, to serve, not just in the Coast Guard, but any of the, the military uh, services has been, uh, been part of the ongoing work. Uh, you know, as you look at the pool of available force to any of us, uh, about 18 years ago, there was a drop off in birth rate. The 18 year olds are not there. They're not there to recruit. They're not there to uh, bring into the academies. And so looking at how, how you broaden the pool of people who qualify to serve. We're looking at the, the current uh, medical requirements and asking whether, you know, so for example, color blindness comes up. You know, should that be a barrier to service? And the short answer is no. I think there were, there's more work to be done there as I'll use the, the cyber specialist, cyber rating that we've stood up as an organization. What I need from you as a cyber specialist with regard to being a full and ready round should look and feel different than what I maybe need from a bosun mate who is forward deployed on a ship. And so that is a work going on. With regard to retention, right, we always pay attention to retention. Still, I don't think any of us have insight into how the blended retirement system is gonna really kind of play out as people then uh, you know, vest from the beginning in their retirements. But we are focused on making it, when, when people come to the organization to serve, making it easier to stay. Uh, looking at uh, not transferring people as often, 
a little bit more stability for families, ensuring that we've got the right support. Right, We recruit an individual, but we retain their families. And so making sure that there's access to housing, health care, uh, child care, all of those become part of the retention uh, focus. And again, just making it easier for people who see themselves serving to continue to serve and, and losing some of the rigidity in the system that we've, uh, that we've had. General Mahoney, I was struck by the fact that all of you, but you in particular, um, spoke pretty eloquently a few moments ago about not just recruiting and retention regarding Marines, but the support system in private industry and in the civilian sector that the Marine Corps needs and that the other sea services need. Why does that resonate so much with you that you wanted to talk about it to that level? If, if I understand uh, the connection that, that you're making or uh, if you're talking about quality of life and quality of service, uh, to rip off a, a phrase unabashedly from the CNO, your accession numbers uh, in the Marine Corps are very, very good. We've made mission. Uh, we will make mission this year. You heard it here first. Our retention numbers are good and getting better. But you can't, it's, not a, it's not a condition of stasis. You don't declare victory and walk on to the next issue. You have to look at the factors that make and keep young men and women Marines. And that equates to their conditions in the barracks, access to health care, access to child care, good chow, good gyms. And you've got to bring upon, you've got to have to bring in new ideas to continually not sit there and declare victory once again, but to make sure that you're addressing the needs that they have for, for this reason. Two reasons, I said to keep them Marines, but also to develop a lethal and, and resilient force so that when those Marines go forward, uh, they will do business at the end of a bayonet with no doubt in your mind. That goes all the way back to how we bring them aboard as recruits, how we transform and make them, how we keep that transformation strong and get them ready to go. It, was, it, was that what you were after? That's, that's the Marine piece of it. And the other piece of it that I was struck by was your comment about um, the career path for that welder in the shipyard yeah. and that kind of thing. That's on your mind as well. Yeah, you, you know, crazy talk. Um, we, after honorable service, put about 30,000 Marines back into the civilian world every year. If there is a pathway, as those Marines look for the next chapter in their life, they've demonstrated training, they've demonstrated discipline, they've probably demonstrated physical and mental bravery in some way. What corporation would not want those type of attributes to work for them? So take the shipbuilding industry, for instance, you know, and I'll call it uh, pipe hitter to pipe fitter. If you could, if you could get a pathway to at least discuss with someone the opportunities that are in uh, the maritime industrial base, you would be able to preemptively recruit people. That's, that's my theory. And you would take those attributes that were so good in service and apply them against uh, what I think is a national strategic need, which is the maritime industrial base. Um, Administrator Phillips, workforce wise, um, you have a new strategic plan what is in that plan and how will it meet whatever the challenges are that you have that I assume are similar yep, to what we've already similar. heard on the stage. Yep. Thank you, Francis. So uh, I think I'll start my, my comments with, and now for something completely different. <laughs> um, so our role in MARAD is to advocate for uh, the U.S. Merchant Marine, uh, which is uh, not a, a service under the, the Maritime Administrator. There has been a U.S. Maritime Service. It was a training-oriented entity. It, it uh, largely stood up in World War II to train mariners. And uh, while it still exists in code, is more of an honorary designation at this point in time. Still, we have mariners uh, around the world sailing on U.S. flag vessels in support of U.S. needs today, commercial mariners, and also mariners manning our ready reserve fleet, which is on a five-day notice to move. So those, those ships are all manned by U.S. mariners. And uh, as we are well aware, and as, as my colleagues have all uh, described, we are short of people. A uh, study was done in 2017, 2018, that showed that we were short at least 1,800 mariners over a six-month sustained engagement thing, desert storm, or run up to desert storm, in an uncontested environment. We know COVID made that worse. 
We see some stabilization now, but we still know that we're short of the number of mariners that we would need if we were to do that same kind of thing. Nevertheless, uh, I think I'd turn some of this now to the Red Sea and let's talk about what's happening there in the context of mariners. Part of our role at Marad is to advocate for the safety of our mariners at sea and the safety of our US flag vessels. And so we have been ardent advocates working with Navy, with Transcom, with Fifth Fleet, with CENTCOM for the protection and, um, and safety of our mariners in the red, operating in and around the Red Sea and in the Eastern Mediterranean and the vessels that are operating in and around the Red Sea in the Eastern Mediterranean. Our US flag fleet carries DOD cargo as one of its most uh, predominant missions. They may also carry commercial cargo, many of them do, but we are required by law to carry 100% of DOD's cargo around the world, and that's largely what our US flag fleet supports, our commercial fleet. Uh, they also, 50% of other government cargo must go US flag. That's another whole interesting process unto itself, cargo preference, but the root of all of this is manpower. If we don't have mariners, then we can't operate these vessels in the way and the time of our choosing in support of DOD's needs in particular, and that's what the programs I described earlier, maritime security, tanker security, cable fleet security, those are there so that the vessels, our commercial fleet is there to support DOD's needs when they need these when they can need this cargo and where they need it. So very important that US mariners are available and that they are willing to serve. So what are we doing to help work collaboratively across industry and with labor to build up our base? First of all, I talked about the NSMB, great recruiting tool, amazing vessels, uh, State Maritime Academy focused. We also own Kings Point, the US Merchant Marine Academy, one of five federal service academies. A lot of work being done at Kings Point to improve and increase our recruiting, our retraining, and our retention. But to the CNO's point about getting more players on the field, one thing we're really short of in the maritime industry is women. There are very few women sailing, less than 5% of the US maritime industry is women, and yet 54% of the population is. So there's a concerted effort to bring more players into the game in the maritime world so that people understand what this lifestyle can be like. And I liken it to the Navy. When you pull in from deployment, you have duty the next day. Be here at 7.30 or you're gonna be late. If you work in the maritime industry, you can sail for a certain period of time and then you're off and you may have to do some training, but you don't come back on until you choose to. It's a different kind of lifestyle. You can live wherever you want in the world. When you're on, you're on. When you're off, you're off. Now what happened during COVID was people didn't get off. Their release didn't show up. They got trapped in ports overseas. And so a lot of people voted with their feet under those circumstances and decided, I'll try something else. Now our task is to bring them back in. We do have a new Mariner Workforce Strategic Plan, which we were tasked to do by Congress. I held it up so that we could work with our partners and stakeholders across industry, Transportation Institute in particular, they might be here, uh, NDTA, who are also developing recruiting strategies so that we can take our work and their work and put it into one document so we could work collectively, which is how you make progress in the maritime industry. Everybody has to cooperate to move forward. Uh, I talked about the NSMBs. We've also, thanks to Congress, been able to double our student incentive program, think ROTC, for merchant marine, uh, you get a commission in the Naval Service as a reservist, you serve a certain amount of time, um, but you, for that you get a, a stipend to help you go through college. It was 32,000 over four years, now it's 64,000 over four years. So with new people coming into the program, we'll get a higher amount there. We think that'll help us retain more people. We also are, you're probably aware of some of the challenges we've had with bullying, assault, sexual assault, and harassment in the industry. We now have the Embark, Every Mariner Builds a Respectful Culture Law, first a program, now a law, to help ensure sexual assault prevention and response across the industry. This has been a challenge at times in the maritime industry. That rulemaking is in progress. It's about to be out on the street. Uh, for those of you who don't live in that world, anytime you have a law, you have to put a regulation in place for how it's gonna operate. That's coming, and all credit to the many stakeholders across industry, carriers, uh, labor, and uh, my pre previous deputy administrator, and Lucinda Leslie, and current deputy administrator, Tamika Flack, who helped put all this together. So uh, focusing on bringing more people in, recruit, train, retain, reduce barriers, building on the strategy that we published this year, building new training vessels, encouraging people to come learn more about the maritime industry, uh, and then ensuring their safety at sea so that we can retain U.S. mariners. And the thing I wanna add about the Red Sea is U.S. mariners deliver. We have not had people not want to sail. 
our U.S. carriers have both commercial obligations in the Eastern Med and the Red Sea and government obligations. They don't miss them. They are there. Uh, we had a ship deploy a couple of weeks ago at the president's direction to set up a JLOTS Benavides. Uh, no trouble manning that vessel. She sailed with a full complement uh, on time. And, uh, and so U.S. mariners show up and they deliver. And we just need to retain more of them and to explain to the nation why they're so valuable and keep people in the service. Thank you. Well, on a personal level, I'm a little troubled when you mentioned the Red Sea because I'm worried that you were reading my mind. And <laughs> it feels like kind of like a comic book this morning more than anything. Um, the questions that are coming in are overwhelmingly focused on the Red Sea and Baltimore. And so I'm going to unfortunately have to combine a bunch of these to be able to get to them. But uh, Administrator, a number of the questions are about what your presence is, what you're doing in Baltimore, and then there are others for the, uh, for the rest of you as well. But give me a thumbnail of what that looks like from your administration's perspective. So from DOT broadly, thank you, Francis, we're all Baltimore all the time right now, from uh, early in the morning on Tuesday. And by the way, I was in Baltimore last Monday on the Green Ocean, the newest US flag vessel to enter the fleet, a waterman ship, a Roro, beautiful vessel. Uh, we left Monday afternoon and Tuesday morning, you know, down comes the bridge. So. Uh, so we went back Thursday, uh, and our role, Marad's role, is working with the port, uh, the Maryland Port Authority, to help them find solutions for the, some of the many challenges they are facing. Uh, and of course, we have an office of freight now within DOT that helps under work as well across supply chain issues between the two of us. Uh, we've been able to, A, have a number of sessions with various uh, constituents and stakeholders that are working within the Port of Baltimore and looking for options, helping us understand what those options might be, uh, and helping the port find solutions for some of the challenges they have. We, you know, we, I talked earlier about the Port Infrastructure Development Program grants we have. It so happens Baltimore County has one that they have been awarded, awarded fairly recently, and they wanted to make some changes to it that we were already working that would have given them more laydown capacity at the Trade Point Terminal, which is outside the Key Bridge. Uh, we were able to expedite that for them, so they now have permission to move forward and get more laydown area prepared more quickly, which will help a, kind of a, as a relief valve to take more roros in particular into that facility and offer. Uh, one of the Baltimore is one of the most uh, highest car import uh, points on the East Coast, but they um, import almost all of the farm tractors and farm equipment that comes into this country. And, and as Commandant and I were talking about this earlier, but big things, big big combines, large tractors, things that the average person won't know how to drive, and it takes a special skill set to be able to handle them. Those things are being absorbed by other ports up and down the East Coast. New York has taken some. Uh, Virginia's taken containers for them. People are going into Savannah. People are going into Brunswick. Brunswick. We have the uh, rail lines adding more routes to be able to get things because what's interesting about Baltimore is all those cars and those vehicles have to be processed there. The processing facilities are still there. If you want heated seats, they get put in in Baltimore. So the cars have to come back to Baltimore to be processed and then shipped out. So pretty complicated set of circumstances, but we're seeing lessons learned from COVID. We're seeing the uh, transportation industry and the um, shipping and supply chain folks more broadly react much more quickly and, and look forward to understand what some of the challenges are. And, and we've, done a, we've seen a really good job across industry in, in rerouting all of these things. So we stay engaged there. I'll go up again just to see how they're doing. Um, my gateway director, I have 10 gateway directors, port gateway directors around the country. Uh, the one for the Mid-Atlantic stays in touch with all of the actions and activities up there, checking in with the Coast Guard as appropriate. Um, and, uh, and of course, we stay engaged with the recovery effort. And then throughout DOT, you know, Federal Highways is involved, Federal Rail is involved, uh, uh, our federal uh, management folks on the, on the trucking side are involved. So there's uh, quite a bit of activity through Department of Transportation, as there will be as we work to get the bridge back up and in place. Commandant Fagan, yeah. you've been on site a couple of times. We were talking uh, backstage about what do you see when you're there and what are yeah. the implications for the guard long term based on that kind of rescue operation. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, I, first I wanna sort of highlight and sort of shout out to the Unified Command. So there are several hundred people working 24 seven in Baltimore uh, to address all of the complexities associated with uh, port, port recovery, debris, debris removal, uh, stabilizing the ship, removal of the ship, and reconstituting uh, the port uh, functionality. And uh, 
you know, I've had the opportunity to uh, overfly the site, but you really don't get a sense for the scale and complexity of what that recovery operation is going to be. You really on the water is where, uh, you know, it's a 940 plus a foot container ship. There's, there was an LNG or there was a gas pipeline running underneath the bow of the ship that it had to be uh, turned off and inerted. There's power lines right over uh, the stern of the ship as they begin to consider how to make the ship lighter so it can be refloated and, uh, and removed. And so there's just, um, you know, a, a host of complexities around uh, the, re the recovery that is going on uh, there. I want to touch on uh, the Marine Transportation System Recovery Unit, which is a cell within the Unified Command, uh, coordinated by the Coast Guard, but all of the equity players uh, at the port, MARAD, the city, uh, state, and others, and that team began working on day one to begin talking about how do we, one, what are the impacts to the closure, but more importantly, as we're able to reconstitute capacity in that main shipping channel, who's the priority, how do you do that, how is it done in a way that is uh, you know, useful and productive to the recovery of the port and provides certainty. The core engineers at the end of uh, last week on Thursday announced the intent to have that channel back to 35 feet by uh, the end of April and then full functionality, which is 50 feet. It's a federally mm -hmm. a main chain channel, 50 feet, and the Corps is hoping that they will uh, be there by the end of May. So there's a depth width, for those of us that are in the maritime business, height, there are a number of uh, challenges there, and the weather gets a vote. Weather on scene has been, uh, has been interesting for the past week, a lot of wind, which can limit uh, lifting capacity. It's a very dive intensive recovery. There, at any given time, there's 40 plus divers in the water working to map and understand uh, the debris field on the bottom, the bridge uh, trusses. And then I mean, we do need to be mindful there are still three people missing. And so, uh, you know, respectful recovery of remains so that we can provide closure to families is still very much uh, an ongoing uh, part. Uh, part of the work and effort. Let me just touch on the investigation, right? So the National Transportation Safety Board is leading the, the accident investigation into understanding what caused the ship. We all see the videos, right? There was clearly a loss of power on the part of the ship that then resulted uh, in, uh, in the impact uh, with the bridge. And so we're working uh, to support the National Transportation Safety Board uh, in that effort and will continue to, uh, to, to stay aligned and um, uh, and do so, but uh, there is uh, there's a sense of energy up there. There's incredible alignment and a really great team of leaders, all focused on the same thing, which is bringing uh, port functionality back into into Baltimore, and um, you know continuing to to create the the opportunity for that. And it's uh, uh, it's going to be a long term effort. This is not going to be uh, quick. Uh, it'll be great to see you know the ship actually refloated and out you know moved and stabilized, but um, it'll, uh, it'll be an ongoing effort and we're really uh, proud of our, our work along with other federal, state, and uh, city entities to, uh, to help, help the port and city of Baltimore. Um, General Mahoney, I don't know what your status is as far as Marines on site in Baltimore, but that type of crisis response is historically something the Corps has been involved with over time here and around the world, Haiti and so on. Um, how are you balancing that with what you want to do with force design modernization, um, whether it's regarding budget, people, whatever? Yeah. Um, let, me, let me see if I can channel some of my inner SECNAV. Uh, nobody has enough money, never had, never will. So I consider balance uh, a, con a consideration in the main of compromise. And compromise to me entails risk. Uh, and where are you going to take that risk? Where are you going to move your resources to minimize risk uh, on both sides of modernization and near-term readiness, uh, crisis response, and force design? Uh, but the, the, the thing that strikes me is just it is not a static proposition. Once you've struck that balance, say, in planning, your fulcrum changes its position or it moves or the considerations that you had going into planning change. Once you take that plan and make a program, your fiscal position changes. That fulcrum again changes because the economy strikes or you look at the 
uh, strategic environment and that changes. So the whole prospect of balance is more of a balance beam than a weight balance. It's continually moving. Uh, as far as crisis response, that is our prime core attribute that we give to the fleet and to the joint force. Uh, force design gets us to where we need to be to answer the manifold questions about the near term and future uh, fighting environment. So when it comes to resourcing, you have to, be, you have to bake in the ability to answer COCOM demands, not 60 days from now, not 30 days from now, but right now. Those deployers are ready, they're lethal, they can go and do the job. Now, on the other side of the ledger, uh, you have to accelerate at a pace that doesn't rob from your near-term readiness. You have to build a depth of magazine that doesn't take and present too much risk to your near-term readiness. And once again, that is a continual uh, programmatic equation that changes. It's a continual budgetary uh, equation that changes and in execution it changes as well. But you'll see this commandant is, is focused on not letting one side of the ledger outrun the other so that right now we can answer whatever the nation calls us to do while at the same time taking those force design attributes, four of them in the main, equipment modernization, uh, training and education modernization, talent management modernization, and logistics modernization. And notice I put modernization on the end of each uh, because we're looking forward in our force design pillars to arrive at a point that is, it's not in 2030, it is a continuing action that allows us to answer the questions once again of the near term and the future fight. Thank you, General. Um, CNO, I'm gonna ask you to be my pivot. Um, tell me what you see when you look at what's going on in Baltimore, but then also take me to the Red Sea. And we talked a little bit in San Diego not long ago about the lessons that you're taking from what's happening in the Red Sea regarding power projection, readiness, and so on. Sure, thanks. I mean, I think the, the takeaways from both is that, you know, we need a force that's, that's ready for any surprise, you know, that really may come its way. And, uh, you know, I think that it's a testament to all the forces that we have here that we provide a lot of options to our nation's decision makers every day and are able to deliver uh, on those promises that we make uh, when we get signed up, you know, to do one of these missions. So happy to be supporting in, uh, in Baltimore with our supervisor so. of, uh, of Salvage, uh, a lot of great experience there, but really pivoting, as you mentioned, over to the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, first of all, it's important to recognize and take a step back about the Red Sea in general, which is, you know, all around the world, the rules-based international order, the, the right to the freely sail, operate, fly in international waters is really under threat. And you see that most acutely right now uh, in the Red Sea. So the importance of this operation and the importance of Operation Prosperity Guardian, uh, of our team working alongside our maritime folks uh, to be able to sail and deliver the cargoes that we need, uh, working with the commercial industry to make sure that free flow of commerce, which really drives the economy all around the world. And so I think it's important to first recognize that standing up for the rules-based international order, the 25 nations that are supporting Operation Prosperity Guardian, many of them are here today, you know, the strength of those allies and partnerships. And, you know, it's the same like-minded nations that are always raising their hand to stand up for that rules-based international order. And the ones that aren't there, they're always the same that are not there to support, and again, the free flow of commerce, economy, that supports all our nations around the world. So I couldn't be more proud of the team uh, that we have out there doing that. I think there's many lessons, though, that we're you know, taking from, from the Red Sea. First of all, uh, make no mistake, the, uh, the Houthis are a well-armed, well-trained, they have been fighting for 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trained by Iranians with Iranian equipment, and uh, this is a formidable force. So as our ships are sailing through there, as our uh, ships are supporting that flow of commerce, they are at risk. They are being you know, targeted through anti-ship ballistic missiles, anti-ship cruise missiles, through UAVs, and they are doing a phenomenal job at, at knocking them down every day. And I think that's a testament to the work of a lot of people in this room over the last 10 years to really shift the focus for the surface warfare community to war fighting, uh, taking a page from our aviation brothers and sisters to have war fight, warfare tactics instructors, 
We've worked hard on our equipment. We've worked hard on our reach back. So as you see the folks being interviewed on TV where they have 13 seconds or 15 seconds to make a decision, they're confident in making their decision and they're confident that their weapon systems are gonna, gonna work and do the job. Mm -hmm. It's also about the integration and the training with our carrier strike group. And again, you know, there's no more uh, valuable asset than the carrier strike group. It doesn't, you know, we can operate freely. Uh, we don't need access spacing and overflight. And uh, you know, you have your sovereign airfield wherever you need it. And uh, it's great to see the partnership uh, between the strike group, between the DDGs, and the Ike is doing a phenomenal job. So very proud of them. Uh, again, proud of all the allies and partners that are there too. Uh, we're also working alongside the EU operation there, as Speedies. So again, another cooperation that we've been doing in other parts of the world and uh, able to do that. I think probably one more good, uh, or probably two more takeaways from the, what we're learning in the Red Sea. One is, you can see this a little bit in Ukraine as well, where the Ukrainians are able to innovate very quickly on the battlefield, uh, getting inside the, the do loop uh, of their adversary and being able to combat their, uh, they make their technologies evolve much more quickly. They can innovate on the battlefield, and that's what we're doing uh, in the Red Sea. So through all these connections that we've built, through the ships, through our warfare centers, through the warfare development centers, and with industry, we're able to understand exactly how the Houthis are evolving mm -hmm. and uh, be able to adjust our own tactics, techniques, and procedures, again, to stay ahead of that threat. I think the last thing I would mention is the importance of logistics. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't mention it in my importance of the shipbuilding, but of course, you know, logistics, mm -hmm. logistics, logistics goes right along with lethality, lethality, lethality. And, uh, you know, we need to always remember the importance of logistics. And so that's another thing that we're learning there. Uh, the importance of logistics, the importance of having expeditionary capabilities for resupply, reload, revive, all the things that we've been working on through contested logistics over the last couple of years. We're seeing that uh, come to bear, the fruits of that work now uh, there in the Red Sea. So again, really important learning. And I would say it's not just about the Red Sea. Everything we're learning in the Red Sea can be extrapolated to any other theater that we might need to operate in. So again, a lot of lessons learned and we're taking um, advantage of the opportunity to learn while we're delivering combat, credible combat power right there in the Red Sea. Regarding innovation, CNO, we have a lot of questions about particular technologies and we don't have time to ask about every individual one of them, but how can you proliferate and scale the innovation that you're seeing happening in the Red Sea that you talked about all across the force and what can other services learn from you to proliferate it all across their, all across the joint force? Yeah, well, you know, I think, you know, the Navy's done a great job over the last couple of years in this innovation space and really uh, working with all our innovation partners that are out there in academia, that are out there in industry to really present to them our problems and say, what do you have that can solve this problem? And let us experiment, let us test it out, let us work with you to uh, make that uh, even more effective capability that we can get into the hands of the warfighters in the next couple of years. So you've seen with Task Force 59, uh, in the Middle East, uh, bringing together lots of different uh, commercially available technologies to provide maritime domain awareness. You've seen it expand in Fourth Fleet. It's over there in Seventh Fleet as well. And uh, now we stood up a disruptive capabilities office to really speed to fleet. Uh, those capabilities, again, that are mature, that are out there, that we can quickly uh, bring into the fleet, that we can quickly scale. And uh, again, it's all about creating those asymmetric advantages uh, that we know we need. Mm. I think if you look at the war in Ukraine, you look at the Red Sea, having asymmetric capabilities, being able to defend against asymmetric capabilities and really augment our conventionally manned forces is what we need to see in the future. Mm -hmm. um, Comment on Fagan, you talked about the uh, commercially available icebreaker. Uh, do you see commercial solutions becoming more common across the Coast Guard? Uh, is that is that ship in particular potentially an example of how you, you might want to try to change uh, the fleet moving forward? Yeah, the, the commercially available icebreaker is really uh, because it, it, it's a ship and capacity and capability that exists today. It, it is an acknowledgement of the, the need to begin, uh, the, the need to have a ship that were additional capacity that we are able to operate uh, in the in the high latitudes, and I know, you know, I get pressed from certainly some of our allies and partners with regard to, hey, you know, we've got we've got this capacity or this design, uh, you know, I think as we look at how all of us do major 
acquisition, the challenges of the budgeting process, the requirements development, uh, there is, there's probably time and need for conversation around how do we do this quicker to ensure that we actually get the capacity the nation needs, but in a time frame that's timely to the, to the risk. And so right now the commercially available icebreakers specifically uh, focused on bringing capacity into our Arctic and our, our high latitude, but uh, we've not had conversation beyond that, but I think as a nation it's probably probably righteous uh, topic to focus on. Uh, audience question for General Mahoney. Um, how are the Navy and Marine Corps driving integration at the staff level, and what are some examples of integration? Yeah, you know, based on my earlier comments, it's, it's not uh, a choice, it's critical and it's required in order to get after the things that we wanna do. Uh, at the staff level or at the task force level, we've been doing this for a while, uh, and uh, I'll give you an example of uh, task uh, CTF 515 over in Bahrain, which is based on 5th Fleet and 5th MEB, commanded by a Marine One Star that does planning. It does advice and options for the fleet commander, for the COCOM, and it takes command and control of uh, expeditionary capabilities when, when they're in the area. Uh, that builds upon a body of knowledge and trust and confidence at the staff level that goes in two directions. It goes up to convince fleets and COCOMs that these folks really know what they're doing as an integrated capability. And then it goes down and in to the rest of the staff to show them that this is the right way, this is the way to do it. And 51.5 uh, has been doing it for at least uh, 10 years. I'm not sure when it started, but we also in the other fleets, in seventh fleet, uh, CTF 76.3, which is based on seventh fleet and the third Marine Expeditionary Brigade, uh, that is commanded by uh, a Navy Admiral and doing the same things, exercising, experimenting, providing options, uh, and also leavening a staff that now combines expertise, combines knowledge to get after and integrated naval effects in the area. As well, in Sixth Fleet, uh, CTF 61-2 is uh, based on Sixth Fleet and Second Marine Expeditionary Br Brigade, and that's commanded by a, uh, a Marine um, one star, and it does the same thing. So at the task force level, uh, there is, there is a, a lot of integration out there, once again, to bring the effect that you require up and to train and to inculcate those things uh, in the downward, downward direction at the lower levels of the staff. General, thank you for that, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Administrator, Commandant, CNO, great to talk to all of you again. Uh, I want to thank the Navy League for inviting me to be a part of this, especially to uh, Mike Stevens, uh, who is a good friend. Julia Simpson has put together a terrific event for all of you this week. Uh, I invite you to be in the Cherry Blossom Room at 11 o'clock for the Senior Enlisted Panel. And uh, I wish all of you a terrific conference. Thank you very much for your attention this morning.